three. Now, today's lecture is looking at Aboriginal Australia. <laughs> and this has gone down fairly well this week. Um, I've come across I've come across a few things that people shouldn't be saying. Um, and in one one lecture on Tuesday, one person's reaction of this image was was extremely sickening. And I will explain what that reaction was in a few moments. So where we're going to with the lecture today is historically archaeologically based lecture. There is a lot of historical content, uh, content in it. There's a lot of archaeological content. And there's, there's not as many images as usually because, in fact, the audio speaks for itself. So what I'm going to what I'm going to um, say straight away is that you've got three individuals in front of you. And um, I've got two images like this um, taken at the end of the um, 1900s. Now, the first thing is this. We have been lied to, all of us, when we have our history lessons. Apparently, the abolition of slavery in Britain was in 1807. The abolition in every area of the British Empire was in 1833. Aboriginals were still being kept as slaves in Australia in 1970. So we have been lied to. In fact, much of what we see as British and English history is um, as a fiction, as we, as we saw the lecture when we looked at the Spanish Armada, um, there was the English Armada. The English Armada suffered more greatly than the Spanish Armada. We, we don't hear about it. So we've got to now start questioning um, British history, um, which, and also very much of the history and archeology span that we're gonna look at today in connection with these wonderful Aboriginals who created such a great culture that they've only started to examine the, um, the civilized cultural um, uh, sense of heritage, history, whatever you want to call it, of the Aboriginals, um, as they're doing today. We've only been really studying these people for the past 30 years. Um, and on Tuesday, the person's name shall not be mentioned. Um, but when I showed this image, he broke into the audio and said, um, this, these are not slaves. And um, I, I, just, I just stood back and listened to him. He said, these are, these are convicts. These are prisoners. Um, th these are people who have done bad things. Um, and then one by one, everybody turns on this person and says, hang on a minute. They got chains around their necks and they're linked with chains. What more evidence do you need? Um, this is slavery. And he said, no, it's not slavery. There's no evidence of it, right? So for once, I don't like to be, to be somebody that rams something down your throat. But at this point, I was so horrified, we had a break. And I come back after the break and I said, this is what happened at this date. And this is what happened at this date. And these were the photographs that were held. And, in, and then in um, 1947, they were still shooting at Aboriginal Tasmanians. Um, and I went through a list and he said, oh, no, it's all made up. These are criminals, he said. And I, and I muted him and I said, I don't want to hear any more of your nonsense. So in, any, in other words, before we start, we're looking at a history um, that we've got to be very careful with. Um, because much of what you do see is published um, is either a, a fiction or it really wishes to undo the sense of this Aboriginal world. So this individual behind me um, is a face that I showed on Monday. So when I did the lecture on Monday, I, I said to those that were with me on Monday, because it's the only live educational class I do. And one of them said, those people in Australia have looked like this for thousands of years. And I said, you've got to be very careful what you're saying, because that could be taken the wrong way. Um, are you saying that these people are backwards? Are you saying that um, in a derogatory term? He said, no, in a highly respectful way. These people have survived in Australia for tens of thousands of years. Um, and their, their facial features and everything 
look as if they've developed separately from other peoples on the planet. I said again, you've got to be very careful what you're saying, because is that going to be taken as being racist? Are we going down the channel of the Anna Nurbe, 1st of July, 1935, where Heinrich Himmler established the archeological Anna Nurbe that was set out to seek um, a superior race, where there'd be a superior race, and then there would be the servile people, and then there would be the people that um, you needed to wipe out. That's the sort of final solution beliefs and everything. So you gotta be very careful. And then we come down to the basic equation is that humanity is not a race, color, or creed. Um, it, it's, it's an existence. So in other words, if you've got more homo sapien Neanderthal genes inside you, you're still a humanoid. If you've got, if you're more Aboriginal genes than somebody from Japan, you're still humanoid. Um, if you're from Africa, um, or if you're from uh, North America, you're still human. And that's the point we were making. So in that, being that we're all humans, being that we're all the same, being that we've, we've had maybe separate um, evolutionary channels, we all still live on this planet. Um, and the one thing that has to be said straight away um, is about the lecture that I'm gonna be doing next week. It's a lecture um, about peaking man. And I think some of you will understand and what I'm just about to say when I talk about um, peaking man. Before the outbreak of the Second World War, um, a body was found um, near Peking and hence the name. And they found another skull and other human remains, all part of the same genus. And around the world, to the experts, not to the populace, they had actually found the early origins of human beings in Asia, not in Africa, in Asia. That created a storm. The storm simply was that the Leakey family had been seeking for um, our ancestors in Africa for nearly two decades, and they hadn't found any actual human remains. They had found bits and pieces, and, but nothing nothing really um, consistent with understanding early origins. They, they found lots of tools, but they hadn't really found any real um, ancestors of, of humanity. But human remains were found um, near Peking. And unfortunately, the Japanese captured Peking and where the body was being kept um, was bombed and we lost the evidence. Now, if that body had survived, if those other human remains had survived, we would be talking about, um, we'd be talking about two areas on the planet the, of cradles of civilization. They wouldn't just be out of Africa, they'd be out of Asia. And we wouldn't be talking about all, all evolving from Africa. We'd be talking about evolving from Asia as well. However, in the 1950s, the Latoli footprints were found evidence of bipedal um, humanoids and then Lucy and the other remains associated with early primates and the early evolution of mankind. And then from that moment onwards, we all evolved from Africa. You can see how biased history is, can't you? The one thing that archeologists should do is offer the evidence and let the historians make fools of themselves and let the historians paint the picture now, if the evidence of Peking man had been presented to the worldwide establishment, photographed and reports done and all the rest of it, and there'd been no Second World War, I would be talking about um, people heading to Australia from China, from Asia, and not just Africa. The history would have been very, very different. And our understanding of history would be very, very different. So if we go back again, to our friend and and Dell's written a few messages flora and fauna until mid 1970s rabbit proof fencing children were moved to uh, be westernized as in canada denisovians we are all human Dell, i've said all that and you are very very 
right. Thank you. So this is more of an emotive lecture than, um, but I've got to try and, I've got to try and keep focused because I'm very much pro-Aboriginal. To be honest with you, I've always been pro-Aboriginal, right? You know, I would say when I was in school, um, you know, I went to an, a school that everyone was the same colour. There was a certain level of racism. We were all guilty of that. People who were different, we were all guilty of that. But for me, even though I may have been in a similar ilk, I had seen Aboriginals as being people. Um, it may sound daft, but, you know, I used to watch, it was the Sullivans, wasn't it? Um, and we used to have, have the odd Aboriginal in the Sullivans. Um, and there was those wonderful films from the 1970s. Um, and you used to see the odd Aboriginal wandering around. And then you may laugh, you've got Crocodile Dundee. And you learn something from Crocodile Dundee. There's a backstory. You actually learn that these Aboriginals are not just people who wander into film sets. These are real people. And in fact, these people have a real history. And they used real Aboriginal actors in Crocodile Dundee. And that's an important point. Because if you watch cowboy and Western uh, movies from the 1950s and 1960s, there were zero um, native, nor native North Americans in the film. They were all, this may sound wrong, all blackened up or all darkened up uh, white people to play Native Americans, right? Um, obviously, black and white films, that's why they have to darken the skin, right? We're not talking about skin color, but the point is, Aboriginals to me throughout my entire life have been painted differently. And then maybe um, the level of racism, um, I don't have a, any racism towards um, Aboriginals, but the archeology span and the history does. And I gotta be, I gotta be very careful to try and step a middle line. Um, now, this important paragraph in front of me, which you can't read, Australian archeology span um, is divided into three sections. And in brackets, a subfield is the Aboriginals, right? So basically what you have when you look at Australian archeology, span you have historical archeology. Span historical archeology span is that archeology span that says that nothing happened in Australia until Western has got there. So that's very biased, so that's one. The other level of Australian archaeology is maritime archaeology. Let's go and work on those bloody shipwrecks. Nobody has worked on those Aboriginal submerged sites, thousands of them that were submerged by the rising water levels. Nobody has worked, there's not one single piece of archaeological excavation been on any of those sites up until reported this year on one single site on the western side of Australia one site of maritime archaeology associated with the Aboriginal um, Australians, right? Shame on you. And then we have the Aboriginal archaeology itself. And we've got to, we've got to mention the following. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my slides. So this, this is an interesting image behind you. It says, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. But there's Aboriginals there and they are speaking to us Westerners. But deep down those Aboriginals, all of them believe that they belong to the land. They don't own the land. The land, the, the land, they are part of the land rather than the other way around, which creates a problem in Western legislation. Western legislation says that the state owns the land and then secondly, the people own the land. The state does not say that the land owns you or you are part of the land. But the Aboriginals have to appear to this West, Western bureaucracy that dominates Australia. And to be honest with you, we're not much better either. A few years ago, I nearly lost my life in trying to save the destruction of our own valuable archaeology uh, in this wonderful country of Cymru that we live in. Uh, for the past, um, uh, for the past, it's been 24 weeks 
um, up until really recently, I, I ran a series of lectures examining the archaeology of Cumbria, archaeology of Wales. And most of the things that I've showed um, were things that people knew nothing about from native build castles, native build monasteries, uh, native battle sites, all these things. We hadn't been told these things in school. And I was telling us about this, right? So we've had to put up with a, with, with a country that's been um, put down, a country that's been um, almost enslaved, but not to this degree, being told what to do. Do you know what? For my entire life, I felt like a second class citizen. I, I felt that... Um, to be the nationality that I am, I've got to work a lot harder than somebody from over the border. And that's reality. Um, but the fact of the matter is enough of that nationalism. These people have had it far worse than us. I might moan and groan about, you know, somebody cutting the brakes on my car because I, I, I was standing up for our history and archaeology. These, these people have died for what they believed in. And they, these people were still enslaved up until the 1970s. So I've got nothing to moan about. It's hard for me, but I've got, I've got nothing to moan about compared with these people. So we, we know what Australia looks like. This is a Northern Cape of Aust Australia. This, this, you've got Papua New Guinea. Uh, this is the Torres Strait now. This is where we go on with my text. Research and investigation. So basically in Australia, there's two types of people. There's Aboriginal Australians, which are the mainland of Australia. And this area here is the Torres Strait Islanders, right? They're, they're slightly different from the mainlanders in Australia, but they are Aboriginals. So apologies, but we're gonna bring them all into one group. They're all Aboriginals to me. They deserve the same respect and not the lack of respect that the company Rio Tinto have given them for destroying their archaeological sites very recently. And listen to these words. Initial archaeological investigation uh, was often focused on finding the older sites and the more modern sites. And usually they were working in the wrong places. Real interest in that great Aboriginal culture, not just, when we talk about the older sites, we're talking about a little bit of um, cave art, right? We're, we're dumbing down the cave art bit because we're not doing it today. That cave art is absolutely outstanding, but we're gonna put it over there today, right? We're gonna focus on everything else that's their culture. So it was only in the 1970s that people actually started to really think about proper Aboriginal sites, proper, Aboriginal um, archaeology, Aboriginal bones and all the rest of it, let, 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 the nuts and bolts of it. They're only starting to be really interested in the 1970s. This site at Lake Mungo, uh, the first sets of human remains were being found at Lake Mungo, dating back to 25,000 years ago. Some of the oldest sets of human remains found anywhere on the planet. And that gives us a problem, but we'll mention what that problem is in a short while. So in the 70s still, even though there's an emergent sort of faith in investigating Aboriginal sites, the archeologists were actually more interested in the environment and the way it impacted on humans and not how humans like Aboriginals lived within the environment and how Aboriginals didn't change the environment. Whereas we Westerners would go there and we would, um, destroy their environment. We would have huge ranches with millions of sheep grazing on land that had been very delicate, a very great bioflora, a great, very great bio um, um, fauna as well, flora and fauna, which was completely destroyed by this grazing. And the archaeologists were more interested in the environment and the way it impacted on humans than actually the people who have always been in Australia. In the late 1970s, people had had enough. They started saying, look, we really need to look at the heritage and managing this wonderful past um, with the increasing demands of Australian Aboriginals um, and those from the Torres um, Strait Islander groups saying that we want to look at our own history. We want to be the archeologists in universities studying our own history. It's only us, we are the ones, we need to look at it, right? And with tears in my eyes, I watched the, um, 
what's the um, what's um, the Sydney Olympics in 2000 and I, and I watched the the runner Freeman who was an Aboriginal um, and she beat everybody on the field that day and um, she had a gold medal and, and I watched that that day and I just started and it was the first time I'd ever seen an Aboriginal flag um, and, and people were saying that she shouldn't have been wearing an Aboriginal flag she should have been wearing that flag um, which has always apparently flown above Australia um, that British flag so she wore an, um, an Aboriginal flag and then she was forced to all wear both of them right um, and there'd suddenly been a shift in the 1980s 1990s and then into the 2000s for their sites are still disrespected, as our sites are in this country still disrespected. I'm not talking about that trumped up idea of Britain, I'm talking about Cymru. Sorry to sound nationalistic, but this type of lecture brings it out in me. And I'm not going to apologise either. Um, but I know a little bit more about this um, and, and civilizations and cultures um, being destroyed than I'm letting on. When me and Michelle, we went to um, we went to the Shetland Islands, right? When we went to the Shetland Islands, um, it was an amazing experience. The people were great. Um, I met my university supervisor. I'd been speaking to him online. Um, and he, he was in Shetland, not Orkney. Um, it's the first time I'd met him, actually. And we, we went around the island, and we had a great time. And then he took me and Michelle aside. And he said that um, in the 1980s, um, they were still blowing up um, Bronze Age and Iron Age sites. They were bulldozing uh, brocks, types of brocks that me and Bill have visited in Orkney. They were, um, they were putting roadways through uh, delicate Viking sites. And none of these sites had ever been worked on. And this was in the 1980s. Um, and, and Michelle, you know, has got a love for the Vikings and you could see the tears rolling down her face, knowing the Viking history had been completely destroyed. Um, and then you come close to it. You, you come close to a history that's being destroyed. And it was being destroyed because of um, North Sea oil. And this was in the mid eighties. And they only, they only employed an archeologist on the island of Shetland for the first time in the middle of the 80s and at which point a large chunk of the island's history and archaeology was gone and that's in my own lifetime and if if that has an effect on me and michelle from a distance um you know all that information lost and destroyed forever because people wanted to destroy it how do you think these aboriginals feel they've had to put up with this all their lives a, a complete abandonment of their of their own point of view but now currently the archaeological research places great importance. It might be a bit late, but it's not too late for some of the archaeology. Um, so, and what they're doing, they're seeing the viewpoints on the land of the people that belong to each other. Consideration is given um, to the beliefs of these people, the sites, um, and these are not just capsules of the past. You know um, this thing that we've that we've suddenly located this week um, is to do with a place um, that <clears throat> has got a very strange area in the history of our country, um, and I don't see that article artifact um, as um, as a capsule of the past. I see it as something very important more than just a capsule, more than just an artifact, something that we need to learn from. And I'll give you a clue. What we're talking about is the wholesale demolition of a complete native monastery site. Everything ripped down to create a housing estate in the night 60s, and I'll say no more. And the Aboriginals believe that the past, the current, and the future are one. Um, it, it's the research agenda, the research level, put significance on the past and also the present and also seeing these things into the future. And that's very important. 
because the difference between a nat native North American alongside an Aboriginal and the way us Westerners look at our past is that these people are connected to their past. In most cases, we're not connected to our past. We, we've, we've disregarded it. We're okay with putting bulldozers through Lewis Castle um, in the south of England. We're, we're happy through, with putting bulldozers through Offers Dyke um, in the past few months. We're happy to do that. We're happy to rip out trees when we look at the HS2 project. We're happy to do all that because we don't have a connection to our past. Because we don't see the past and these living things or anything as being any relevance. But, um, and I'm probably going too far now, but the fact of the matter is, is that an Aboriginal believes, for example, that if there's a painting, that an Aboriginal can go into that painting and add to it. A painting that may have been there for 10,000 years, an Aboriginal believes that they can go into it and add to it or rub it out and so on. Because that art is living and breathing. That's why they're connected to it. That's why they believe in it, unlike us. Now, none of us would say that we're, we're always connected to every single piece of archaeology we visit, right? Uh, but these people are. It's part of who they are. It's their, it's their identity. Now, I've struggled with my, my, my sense of, um, of being for a very long time. Um, you know, what is it like to live in this country? Um, why, why are we not told about our country? And it's exactly what the Aboriginals feel like. So let's move on again. So back to this image. So the first settlement of Australia is a popular research topic, both in archaeology and in the public um, arena. Now, before I read out the rest, right, this is my unbiased bit of the lecture. I'm reading out what's in front of me, not what I think. Um, but I'll tell you what I think. Um, when I was um, teaching in Cumbria um, in 2012, 2011, 2012. Um, I had been teaching my classes in Cumbria for um, about eight months. Then we decided to put them on, on Skype and then the class in Cumbria has been going on Skype for eight years. This is, you know, the online stuff works, it works. But I remember saying to one of the guys who's still with us in Cumbria eight years ago, um, we were looking at um, North America and I said, isn't this amazing? The Clovis people of North America are not the oldest people in North America. Another site's been found in Pennsylvania. Um, and we now know that people got to North America 500 years earlier than this Clovis site, right? That it was a thousand years earlier. And I said to Andy, I said, look, in five years time, they will have placed when the people first got to North America back 5,000 years. And you know what? I was wrong, very wrong. It turns out to be 31,000 years ago, people got to North America and counting. And when you're wrong from that point of view, um, you have a big smile on your face. You're, you're, you're wrong, but right at the same time. You're right for saying to people that things are different. Um, you don't always have to keep those boundaries. So let's read out, read out what I've got in front of me. There is a consensus that no human or closely related species evolved independently in Australia. I don't agree with that consensus. This is because there has been no species of primate found in Australia, either in the present or in the fossil record. I tell you what, right? If you, if you dig hard enough in Cornwall, right, you could probably find dozens of Roman forts, dozens of Roman villas, but we haven't got them because nobody's been looking. If you look hard enough, you will find archeology. span You will find it. Um, you know, I've got a bit of a fantasy here, Michelle. Me and Michelle, we talk about King Rhys being, um, being killed in battle against Yestin ap Gorgon, um, who, who allied uh, um, with the Normans in the valleys here at Penrhys, right? Um, and she says about finding the golden crown of, of, of King Rhys, right? 
you never know we could we could find it one day if we searched every single crevice and every single bit of these valleys around here and it's exactly the same that can be said for finding early origins if the leaky family had been working in china it would china would be the cradle of civilization if the leaky family had been working um at lake mungo in 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 um um new south wales in australia they would have found um primitive origins of australians by now but they didn't and they they haven't and the fact of the matter is they're only really starting to look today this is why australian archaeology is so behind it is therefore assumed that the first settlers of australia came from outside and they definitely came from africa at, at present, the fossil records suggest um, that the first settlers, settlers were homo sapiens or fully modern humans. There's a bit of a problem with that. And the problem is, is now we're getting dating evidence of sites in Australia going back to 75,000 years ago. Now, if these people in Australia are modern humans, um, they would have bypassed Asia and gone straight to Australia and then walked out of Africa 20,000 years later. Because we're told that modern Cro-Magnon man, an old term, Homo, Homo sapiens sapiens, walked out of Africa sometime around 50,000 years ago. So how is it they managed to get to um, Australia before they got to Europe? The answer is there's something very weird about this whole story. So there is controversy over where the first Australian Aboriginals actually came from. Now, Asian scientists believe, and they've demonstrated that there are similarities between Australian Aboriginals and Melanesians and Indians, you know, from the subcontinent of, of India. Uh, but they're, they're saying that there's more similarities with them than there are from Africa. So in that case, where did these Melanesians come from? Did they come from Africa? Did they come from Asia? Or even better, did they originate from Australia? I should be burnt in hell for saying these things. You know, you should make up your own minds. However, it's very difficult to do something like this without seeing that there's something really weird with the dates. And when we go to Lake Mungo after the break, you'll know exactly what I mean. However, the suggested date of 60,000 years ago for initial settlement is quite early, but now we've got 75,000 years ago. The suggested date of 60,000 years ago for initial settlement is quite early when compared to other areas of the world. Now, that's really interesting, really interesting. Because we've got loads of evidence in Australia, which is, which is earlier than anywhere else, or not everywhere else, but in lots of places. Um, so what we're saying, we can have early stuff in Australia, but it must have come from Africa when there isn't the earlier stuff elsewhere. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So what we're talking about, we're talking about um, in Iraq, for example, we've still got large Homo sapien Neanderthal populations about 50,000 years ago, right? Um, and we're thinking, right, they're there, but there's people in Australia 75,000 years, years ago. Where did these people come from? And you start to have all these questions. Um, so the suggestion could be that they derived from Africa, or the suggestion is that they've, they've derived from Asia. And the other thing that's thought that when they came from Africa, they, they, um, they, they left Africa, they kept going, they didn't leave any evidence, they kept going, they didn't leave any evidence, they kept going. Oh, there's Australia over there, we've got to get to Australia, it's going to take us a few years, don't worry about it. So they, then they get to Australia and they think, oh, we're going to settle here, wonderful place, and they can send postcards home to people in Africa, and suddenly people are going to start live, live in the middle, you know? Uh, I, I'm just, um, sorry I'm putting my own straight on this to too much. Um, it's just too emotive, something like this. So we see settlements in Australia. Some believe that we've got, we've got many settlements in Australia at the time of the last major um, Ice Age maxim, which is around 60 to 40,000 years ago. 
when something called the Sunder Shelf once existed. Now, what is the Sunder Shelf? Let's go there. No, it's not Sunderland, and uh, we salute you, my friends. Um, and just one thing I'll say about this image quickly before we move on uh, to the chat. Um, you can see that these people are actually from the same tribal groupings because of the marks on the stomach. Well, if these guys are criminals, they must have all nicked the loaf of bread in the same village. You know, I just, it, it, it really annoys me when, you, when you've got the evidence of slavery, absolute slavery, this is slavery. Oh, and by the way, right, nobody nicked any bread who was female. It was just men who nicked bread, you know what I mean? You, you start to see that it's almost history wants to be written by the British every single time. There was no slavery in the British Empire after 1833. So what was Australia? So again, more of these um, Australian faces, more of this Australian characteristic and this chart here. So what we're, what we're talking about is the Sunder Shelf. Now, the Sunder Shelf itself, um, if I can get my annotation up, this is Sun, is somebody falling asleep? I'm sure some, somebody was snoring then. Um, so basically, this is all known as the Sunder Shelf. Okay, and it was once believed that the Sunder Shelf almost connected Australasia with Asia. Um, but it's Dell, he's fallen asleep. Dell's actually <laughs> fallen asleep. He has, has he? Yes, he's fallen asleep <laughs> on the floor. He's snoring. <laughs> um, right, anyway, where, where, where was I? Nudge. Yeah, I'm not going to give him a nudge. We'll, we'll just get to the end of the lecture and we'll have to get him watching the version online. Sunder oh, Shelf. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right, Sunder Shelf. Now, um, lots of archaeologists have argued that... Um, it was possible to get to Australia between 60 and 40,000 years ago. But even then, you'd have had to have gone through a water channel, right? Um, and what I know about water channels is that when you have narrow waters, the race of the water is going to be really fast. When you've got a large open span of water, the, the currents, and, and it's not, they're not going to be as fast. They're not going to be as treacherous. Anyway, if you look at the Bristol Channel, as you get closer and closer to Newport, the races and um, and so on start to get more treacherous, you know, the, the currents and all the rest of it. And, 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 and what I'm thinking, that if you're talking about going, if you're going over to Australia 60,000 years ago, when we know we've got people in Australia 75,000 years ago, but go with this, we've got a mass movement of people from Africa 60,000 years ago, apparently. They would have got to a point and they would have seen that there's still water between the Sunder Shelf, 100 miles of water, and Australia, right? One, why would they have gone to Australia when they probably wouldn't have been able to see it anyway because of the curve of the earth? Um, and, and the water would have been very treacherous because it would have been narrow. Surely it would have been better to have gone over to Australia when um, the, the water was much wider. Anyway, all those different ideas. It's just all that speculation. Anyway, let's just go back to my notes. So, so when we uh, when when we look at this, um, if if we want to think about the first major settlements um, of Australia, it is theorised that the first Australians crossed the sea between um, uh, between Papua New Guinea um, and Australia, and then between Sunda itself in in the on, on the chart there, which is. Um, in the West and Timor and Australia. Um, but again, it, it begs the question of who were these earlier people who were in Australia? We've got evidence for them. We know they existed 75,000 years ago. And there's some suggestion of people living in Australia as far back as 125,000 years ago. If that's the case, these are not out of Africa. And the reason why they're not out of Africa, the first humanoids didn't even leave Africa until about 100,000 years ago. So who are these people in Australia? Would they get there by alien craft or something? Oh yeah, they must have come from what they did, right? They jumped in boats 
um, in, in Afro Africa before ocean going boats were ever invented. Oh, and they swam over to Australia. That's what they did. The whole thing starts to fall apart. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I'm going to do this little bit. Then we're going to look at that map and we're going to do a few other things. Um, and then something I didn't do was to show you the stuff about Dennis Powers and make sure I do it before we go on break because you won't do it otherwise. Mm -hmm. So anyway, controversies in Aboriginal archaeology. Back to what I'm going to do, I'm going to paraphrase everything, put it into one, right? Everything I've said, everything other people have said, the biased and unbiased stuff, and you can make up your own mind. So here we go. There is significant debate over the arrival of when people got to Australia, tick. Until the 1950s, it was often believed that arrival of the first Aboriginal people was within the last 10,000 years. We're going to go off on a tangent, and the tangent there is um, that it was believed um, that you know, the Aboriginals didn't really get to Australia until a few thousand years ago. And if the Aboriginals didn't get to Australia until a few thousand years ago, when we got there just a few hundred years ago, um, we have got an equal claim over Australia alongside the Aboriginals. So it was kept under the thumb that Aboriginal archaeology is only, it, it, it's, is no more than a few thousand years old because it did the political narrative. But in the 1950s, things changed. Uh, the dates were extended to the last ice age. So people started to think maybe people got to Australia 30,000 years ago. But we still have a claim on Australia, you know. If you look at it, we've been here 300 years. The Australian, the Aboriginals have been here 30,000 years. If you take a couple of knots off, we've got an equal claim to Australia. Great. Uh, and this is all about um, the rises and falls of water. Some archaeologists believe, for example, that the water level around the Australian coastline um, has risen by about 150 meters. Now, along when Doggerland flooded, we're talking about a rising water levels of about 100 meters. And look at the land that was lost, a third of the size of Europe, which was lost. The, um, when we look about the, the water, the, the land that was flooded, uh, 40,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, whenever it was flooded, it was over stages anyway, probably between 100,000 and 30,000 years. years uh, the, the coastline of Australia has retracted by 150 miles. The water level has risen up to 150 meters in height. Um, that means that most of the archeology span of the Aboriginals is still under the water and never been found. So the early origins of people actually in Australia are still to be found. They're not to be found on dry land, they're to be found under water. So the radio, the radio carbon, um, the radio carbon dating, um, we've got an extension to when radio carbon dating is useful. There's something known as the radio carbon dating barrier. So you can only um, radio carbon date things in um, in archaeology up until about 30,000 years, 40,000. But that barrier has been extended by about another 10, 15,000 years. So we're able to go further back. But when the Aboriginals were in Australia initially, whenever they come from, right? Um, we don't have radiocarbon dating technology. We could use thermal luminescence dating, or we could use lots of other dating techniques. Um, so it is argued that um, 70,000 years best fits the evidence um, from the Human Genome Diversity Project and a number of other new dating technologies to tell us when people were first in Australia. Uh, if if, if 70,000 years ago is being proven as a fact, then as, as humanoids, these are in Australia before they got to Europe. Do you see why my head's hurting? Um, some have proposed dates of people being on Australia as far as 120,000 years ago. This is not usually accepted by many archeologists, but nor was it accepted me saying, eight years ago that we'd find evidence in North America of people being there 30,000 years ago. I would be laughed at, as I would be now if I said that, uh, that um, Aboriginals evolved in Australia. That, that would be a, a, and then you start to think that um, human populations um, didn't migrate from Africa, they migrated from Oman or Asia and so on and so on. Um, and you, and, and my notes, here we go. <laughs> I gotta read this out. There's actually an archeologist saying this, right? 
Um, some modern humanoids like the Aboriginals um, left Africa, rapidly traveled across South and Southern Eastern Asia into Australia, um, and then they entered Asia and Europe separately. I, I just can't, I can't get that in my head. I really can't. How do you, how do you go through Asia without going through Asia and leaving any evidence? So these are the problems that we're left with. So what I'd like to do, um, I can remember getting very animated with this map in front of us. Now we are seeing a map in front of us, good. And there I have, I've disappeared for Bill just to wind him up. Look at that, there's only my head, Bill. And if I do this, Bill, I've disappeared. <laughs> you know, I like winding Bill up, he winds me up enough. Right, let's get sensible again. Um, it, it's good to be silly in a lecture like this because it, it just gets so heavy otherwise. Um, so this this is rather interesting, right? And point point out a few. There's two problems, right? The this is what's believed to have been the Australian coastline maybe forty thousand years ago, right? You can see the amount of land that's been lost. Um, is probably more than this. And it's said that a third of the Australian landmass has been flooded um, over this period of time. Now, there's only one nautical reported this year Aboriginal site ever been excavated, one. And it's here. It's in, it's in the depth of water, which is 2.5 metres, right? Now, the waters here are probably 150 meters in depth, right? Now, this is where it gets rather bizarre. If the if the archaeologist is saying, okay, it's saying 120 meters there, but there you go, 140 meters. If the archaeologist is saying the migration route was this, right? Um, you know, all this water, there you go, you know, thousand odd miles. Um, you go all the way like this, right? They went like this, and 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 they went like this, right? There's one problem with this um, migration route. There's no evidence for it because um, that's underwater. The migration route there is underwater. It's underwater. It's underwater. So whoever's proposing this migrationary route was talking hogwash for one. And the next thing is, if you look at this, there's something very, very queer, right? It's that. What can you see about those dates? Those dates, my friends, are much earlier than that date or that date or that date earlier than that date, earlier than that date, earlier than that date. In other words, the oldest evidence on this map, if, if this is to go by, right, is actually in the south of Australia. So if the earliest evidence is in the south of Australia, how did they get there? Because the later evidence is above, the later sites are above. The only explanation is, um, Forget about the out of Australia uh, pri um, primate theory or whatever. But you could think that over um, tens of thousands of years, people had settlements that are now flooded, right? And then they suddenly sort of made it a bit of inland back out to sea. And then they went over here um, and so on and so on. This is the only way of explaining what's going on, because otherwise it just doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So carry on. After the break, we're going to look at Lake Mungo, right? So um, we're going to look at Lake Mungo and we're going to look at the, um, do you know what I need to do? I need to end on a high with Lake Mungo and not get too depressed. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you um, the damage that um, the Rio Tinto project has actually done. Um, and here we go. This is where things go wrong. 
are you are you seeing this on have you seen these headlines on your screen uh wonderful Henri? yes i wonder what your avatar is going to look like <laughs> have you ever wanted a beard oh we've had that all right fair enough rio tinto rio tinto expected to destroy 124 more aboriginal sites so what I'd like to do is um, stop sharing again and actually go to here. And what we're going to do, we're going to share again. Lake T uh, what's going on at Rio Tinto? So all these wonderful images. That is what um, Rio Tinto looked like at the beginning of the year. It doesn't even look like this now because it's all been blown up. Um, this is what the landscape looks like today. And Rio Tinto is a prime Aboriginal site. Rio Tinto apologizes for blowing up um, 46,000 year old Aboriginal site because they didn't know it was there. That's the excuse used every single time. Oh, by the way, um, by the way, Henry, right? I accidentally murdered a friend of yours, right? But I get away with it. I didn't know it was a friend of yours and I didn't know I was murdering them, right? That doesn't stand up in law, it just doesn't work. But it happens in archeology span all the time. And I'm told that Rio Tinto is a really bad company. Um, they, they've, the amount of damage that they've done in Africa and South America, um, Rio Tinto destroying um, tropical rainforests, whole landscapes, archeology, span heritage, you name it, they're responsible. They did a little bit of work um, at Rio Tinto and it tells us um, of the, of the um, evidence that is actually at Rio Tinto. Um, Henri, you've really put a cat amongst the pigeons with that. Um, so <laughs> th this is this is what this this whole thing used to look like, okay? And this was this man's archaeology. So they're working there, and they were working there at the beginning of the year in the hope that they could get um, UNESCO to make this a World Heritage Park. To make something a World Heritage Park, it takes about two years. Uh, Rio Tinto got in there, destroyed it, and it was too late. Oh, and they didn't know it was there. Oh, God. I'm sorry, the cave art. <laughs> we didn't know it was there. Oh, there's a bit of archaeological evidence. We forgot to read it. It, it just, it, it, you can't make her up. You really, really can't. So, so let's go back to this Rio Tinto article. Rio Tinto expected to destroy 124 more Aboriginal sites. Indigenous owners raise concerns at inquiry into mining corporations demolition of Junker Gorge caves. So there, there it is, Junker Gorge in a photograph taken days uh, before the 46,000 year old cave were destroyed by Rio Tinto in May. So, um, so this says taken days before. So look at the state of it days before, what it must have looked like when it was blown up is another story altogether. And I'm actually, okay, forget, forget the Aboriginal history, right? Forget the Aboriginal culture. What about the flora and flora that is just being wiped out there as well? Have these people got any humanity at all? Twats. Mining giant Rio Tinto is feared to be pressing ahead with plans to destroy a further 124 Aboriginal heritage sites. They get away with doing it in our own country, for God's sake. They can definitely get away with it, uh, doing it in um, Aboriginal Australia. Um, at an iron ore development in Australia, despite the outcry over its destruction of sacred 46,000 year old caves earlier this year. And the Australian um, Prime Minister actually agrees with this crap. So even the politicians want this to happen. Does that sound very fam familiar with HS2? Among the threatened sites in the mountainous region of Pilbara in the Western Australia, which is um, obviously uh, South, um, so um, East, uh, South Wales, um, New South Wales, on the one side, which we're going to be looking at with Lake Mungo, it's obviously that bigger area on the left-hand side of the map. Um, so among the threatened sites in the mountainous region are uh, rock shelters containing Aboriginal paintings and actually whole uh, Aboriginal cave shelter settlements. Um, it's, it's basically saying Stonehenge-like arrangements of stones. Didn't know anything about this. I built structures that are believed to 
um, be of potential archaeological value. I tell you that's sort of sweeping it under the carpet. A group, group representing the indigenous residents of the affected area said the Anglo-Australian Corporation had stopped short of promising a review into the action, following outrage over blasts um, that demolished the Junker um, Gorge rock shelters in May. Um, and this is, here we go, Rio have stated in various forms that they will consider reviewing the agreement. We don't have a formal commitment. Um, and Grant Bushell, um, the Aboriginal Corporation's chief executive to sort of monitor this type of thing, told a public inquiry led by the Australian uh, Parliament into the destruction of Junker Gorge. Rio Tinto, the second largest metals and mining company in the world, received widespread criticism from its treatment of the site, which led to the resignation of CEO Jean Sebastian um, Jacou and, and his two uh, deputies earlier this month. The multi um, the multinational had been lacking more generally in its protection of culturally significant sites across the region, according to Ying um, Hagaka um, archaeologist Anne Fagan, raising concerns over how the rest of the sites would be managed. We have 327 heritage sites and 124 will be destroyed by Western Rangers expansion project. The inquiry also revealed that Aboriginal groups had secretly been subject to contracts banning them from objecting to mining developments on their ancestral land. In other words, they've been blackmailed, um, prompting questions over whether they have adequate consent. In a statement, Rio Tinto said it was building on decades of deep engagement as it assessed the sites to gain better understanding of the cultural significant values placed on these sites by the Ying Hwanga people. It added that it had pledged to update its policy, including details around the issue of consent with all groups on whose land it operates in the region. So in other words, uh, we haven't got anything else with that. So in other words, it's just an excuse. They're gonna do nothing about this at all. Uh, the, these, these sites are destined to continue to be destroyed by the multinationals and the politicians do a bugger all about it. And that's what, typically what politicians do, nothing in the case of history and heritage. Um, so a very high um, sounding lecture. Are there any questions? Henry? Uh, no, I mean, I think uh, this is quite uh, an important <coughs> and revealing lecture, I think, um, certainly, I've had a quick read on a couple of things already and uh, the slavery part is, you know, is astonishing. Even up to 2016, um, they've got modern slavery figures of about 15,000 in Australia, um, still existing. Um, but certainly in the 1970s, the, the slavery activity, which also involved the island people as well significantly and um, Asian people, it was just embarrassing. Well, embarrassing actually is too little a word. To be honest with you, the, these um, these Australians uh, are still British. The Queen still is still the mon uh, is the monarch for Australia, um, and and we as a British people still um, we still support slavery. We're still a, a slave empire, yeah. and 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 our 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 Queen is meant to be our monarch, um, and. and yeah, it, it makes you ashamed to be British, to be honest with you. Legally, we're British. We're not Welsh, Irish, Scottish. We're British. And, and this is, the, these, the, we should be ashamed of our actions as Britons with doing nothing about this. We are all responsible. Bill. Yes, um, unfortunately, the Australian government have no champions. No one really interested in heritage. Um, they never have been, have they? They've no. always pushed to one side. There's an irritation, and they've grouped them all into Arnhem Land in the past, haven't they? And just said, you were there, mate, forget about it. And they, there's, there's huge problems, there's social problems now. There's no jobs, there's drug drug, drug taking is rife, alcoholism is rife. Yes. These people have got no hope. They haven't got any hope because they've got no champions. And as always, profit comes before everything these days, isn't it, unfortunately? It's a sad state of affairs, it really is. And, and that, with that, that, yeah, exactly. Their land has been decimated by the Westerner with with the sheep grazing and all the rest of it. And yeah, yeah, the, it, yeah it's, this is all still there. Um, right, Pam, anything? 
Not Pam, Pat. I just thought I find it very sad. It's very sad. So, that's um, this, all. this wasn't meant to be a negative lecture. I'm trying to make it positive by telling you, but suddenly it really started to get that way. Right, what about you, Jessica? Um, I think it was really good how you sort of approached it with the respect that was needed as well to sort of um sort of give them a narrative that helps them be proud of who they are really they um do. and there's there's a lot of narratives that are out there that sort of you know dehumanizes them and is something that needs i think needs to be changed but i think a lot of people um you know who aren't really into history and sort of accept the you know the mainstream sort of arguments that are put out there and um, sort of say oh it's in the past is it is not important to now but it's like what we say history is, is so important to now because um i think you know understanding our history will solve a lot of problems you know with race i think it'll also solve you know pandemics we just never learn from our past and you know sort of give everyone the respect from it and i think you know you've approached it with the right respect thank you um and um what about you Anne? Uh, it's always interesting to see the um photo photographs that are used in the victorian times you know um they were very dehuman like humanizing and you could see the attitudes of people you know like there's some sort of specimens you know that need to be photographed like this you know they do it with africans as well and um thank goodness i think things have come a long way you know i but mean they are getting more respect now but there's still, still a way to go yeah yeah still a way to go yeah i agree um you know i i was um i, I want to do this dennis powers thing quickly before the break but um you know i didn't want a, a big rush at the end but a few about four year, five years ago, I, I went to a market stall. Um, it was part of the Abergavenny um, food festival, and at that market stall, there were clothes at that market stall, and I identified them as clothing from um, gypsy <laughs> groupings of people from Eastern Europe. Um, and these clothes look really good. They were authentic clothes from the late 1930s, 1940s. And then I suddenly realized that these clothes had been taken off people going into the, um, the camps. Yeah. And somebody was selling these clothes. They were really nice clothes and I, I was absolutely horrified. And when you talk about dehumanization, um, you, you still see it around you. And, and I was, I, 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 there, there, there was these, these beautiful objects from the 1930s, you know, complete items of clothing. And I identified this stuff straight away. Um, you know, you could work out whole um, Romani gypsy families from this. And, um, and, and I just, yeah, I, I was tempted to buy some of this stuff. And I just thought, I can't. It was just didn't feel right. But the, that, all those, even little things like that are very dehumanizing. So what I'm going to do, right, um, before, we, before we go on our break, I just want to show you something. Um, don't get too excited, Del. Oh, Del's not there, is he? Um, <laughs> Dell's fast asleep. You better take his look, he's muted. But I can't do anything about it, woman. He, he's fast I'm asleep. Sorry. He was actually physically snoring. Well, I'm here. Yeah, you were, I Del. Oh, I can hear him. Del, you went asleep. Did I? Yes. Oh. You were bloody oh, well. snoring. Was I? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so guys um this is this is actually um if i show you right if i show are you are you seeing this on the screen yes now basically um yes it's great to have this technology now i, I it's brilliant so um so basically what you can see is where where we were the other day um we parked the car by there um, and then we walked down here, down the public footpath, um, wow. and we kept going. And unfortunately, I was, because of the foliage was still thick, you couldn't see the castle, right? So what I said, I would show people um, an aerial view of the castle. Now, 
you can just about see a wall, an alignment of a wall from that image. However, if you go to this other image and we rub that out there, you can see a black and white image now. So if we zoom in, you can see a wonderful black and white image and you can see a wall there, a wall there. You can see another wall coming there and you can see a wall there. That is Dennis Powers Castle. Now, yeah. the problem is you used to be able to get to it, but you can't, I couldn't, I couldn't take a group to it. And the other thing as well is right, um, even though we, it was an educational <laughs> visit, um, it, having the police called because we were trespassing uh, would not, not have helped us. I would have done a runner on it to let um, Bill take res full responsibility. Um, so the final, the final thing I want to show you then is when we, um, what we did, um, if you follow the cursor, um, it's very difficult to actually find it. Hang on. Hang on. I I'm, I'm struggling now. So what, what we did, we followed... Um, I'm probably not going to be able to do this from these maps because I need a modern map with me. So we followed uh, along the side here, along here, um, and then we went back on ourselves down this valley. And if we rub all that out there, hang on, God, let's go to the pot. And if we rub all that out there, the hill fort that we were talking about um, is in fact here. That's where the hill foot is. And the little bit that we saw, Bill, you know, the, the earthworks at the end, they are in here. Yeah. So um, this is where the earthworks were. And what you can see quite clearly, something that you can't really make out on the ground because you don't have an aerial view, um, is that if we rub all that out, uh, you can, and I'm going to move this a little bit more so it's center, you can clearly see what I was describing, I was describing that water would flow down this valley, all the way down here, all the way around, and it would be completely surrounded in water 2000 years ago. That's the site we visited. And in fact, strangely enough, um, if, you wanna, if you wanna compare the two, so if we rub that out um, and we do a little line there, that there um, is basically that. And it's not even marked on the map. Um, so this site wasn't really recognized. This map itself is, I think, from 1884 or somewhere like that, the one on the left. Site wasn't worked on until 19, the late, late, the 1956, 1950s. So, so hopefully that's been of some use. Um, and the technology I'm using now is the same technology that we will, you've got, you've got a little bit of fun with map stuff tonight. This is, this is the stuff that we're going to be using tonight. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, stop the screen sharing. Um, and I think we've done all the questions except for Delwyn. Um, Del, anything you want to say? No? Nope. Okay, we're going to take a break. Um, okay. and, and, and my beautiful, my beautiful Del, um, we salute you, Del. One. So we're back with the lecture now. I sometimes have stuff thrown at me through the break or whilst I'm lecturing and by the end it's too late. But um, we, I've actually just had a, a nice email through from Henry that took him at least two minutes to write. Uh, but it'll take me six or seven minutes to read out. Um, so the place that we're going to go to is Victoria. Um, the state of Victoria. So that's where we're going to go next. Now this is fascinating. I haven't really assess this in my head. So I'm going to read it out as it is. So here we go. Australia's Aboriginal population is said to be the oldest continuing civilization on earth. But just how old is it? It's currently believed that um, the Aboriginal ancestors made their way to Australia as long as 65,000 years ago but new evidence uncovered at an excavation site in the continent's southeast may push the timeline back much further. If the site does turn out to be human-made, um, human it suggests that people have been living in Australia for as long, for as long as 120,000 years. 
what I was saying earlier on was just a suggestion from the notes I had. The place of interest known as um, Moyile, I'm going to have to pronounce this, M-O-Y-J-I-L site, is located in the city of Warrenobyl, uh, Victoria. Why do you have to send me an article like this? Archaeologists have been investigating the area for over a decade, and the basis for these extraordinary claims is a mound of material, including sand, seashells and stone. That, may, that might not sound like much, but the scientists suggest that it is what's known as a midden, um, especially um, essentially an ancient above ground landfill. The remains of fish, crabs and shellfish have been found in the mound, which may be all that remains of long eaten meals. While charcoal, blackened stones and other features may be all that's left of ancient fireplaces. But the really intriguing part of the site is its age. Mod Jill, um, if Mod Jill does turn out to be a human site, um, it could force us to rewrite not just the history of Australia and the history of Australian occupation, but our understanding of human migration worldwide. Out of Africa will no longer be, yeah. What makes the site so significant um, is its great age. Dating of the shells, burnt stones and surrounding cemented sands by a variety of methods have established that the deposit was formed about 1,220 years ago. When it says cemented sand, it means compacted sand and it sort of formed a layer. That's about twice the presently accepted age of uh, the arrival of people on the Australian continent based on archeological evidence. A human site of this antiquity at the southern edge of the continent must be of international significance because of its implications for the movement of modern humans out of Africa. Oh, we're back to that one. But there are quite a few caveats to this claim. For once, there's every chance that the mounds aren't middens at all, but natural formations of some kind. De definitive proof of human occupation from uh, that era, such as tools or bones, have yet to be found. On top, of, on top of that, it doesn't quite make sense within the current narrative. Genetic studies have shown that Aboriginal peoples only split off from other human populations around 75,000 years ago. That's the date I gave for Australia. Um, after their ancestors migrated out, for, out of Africa through Southeast Asia into Australia, Australia. Whether I agree with this or not, I'm just reading it out. The, the oldest known definitive proof of humans on the continent are artifacts dated to 65,000 years ago. Uh, but my notes tell me something different. Found in Kakudu National Park along Australia's northern coast. This makes sense given its, close, uh, given its closeness to the islands and the people were thought to have, have used these to cross over to Australia. The site that we're talking about is on the complete opposite of the continent. And we've mentioned that the oldest sites are in the south. So this fits in with what we said. And it's hard to believe humans appeared that far south at a time um, when they were otherwise believed to be more or less restricted to Africa. Humans aren't thought to have even entered Asia before 100,000 years ago. Peking Man tells us something else next week. The researchers acknowledge the weight of the claims and say um, they're working to continue to examine the Mojil site for further evidence of human occupation and hope others will do the same. We recognize the need for a very high level of proof of the site's origin. Within our own research group, the extent to which members believe the current evidence supports a theory of human agency <laughs> Uh, ranges from weak to strong, but importantly, and despite these differences, we all agree that available evidence fails to prove conclusively that the site is of natural origin. What we need now is to attract the attention of other researchers with specialist techniques, which may be able to conclusively resolve the question of whether or not humans created the deposit. Now, if they have, this is going to be massive. So anyway, Back to where I'm not, I don't want to discuss that actually because I haven't had time to put it in there. It's a bit like an article of the week. So, so here we go. So we're back to this map, are we? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good. I'm glad you're awake. 
because everyone else seemed to have fallen asleep. So the next site we're going to look at is a site known as Lake Mungo. There it is. This is nothing to do with um, Flash. OK, this is Lake Mungo. Um, and this site itself has got absolutely amazing evidence. And I'll probably read every single bit out that I've got in front of me. So that's that's what we'll do. So we know where the site is. So there we go. There it is, Lake Mungo. Lake Mungo, Lake Mungo in New South Wales, the site of the world's oldest known ritual cremation. This was discovered in 1969. And the remains of more than 100 individuals have been found since. Many are fragmentary, but they include a virtual complete skeleton, stone tools, freshwater mussel shells, and bones of fish and land animals mark the camping places of people who hunted, fished, and gathered on the shores of Lake Mungo some 40 plus thousand years ago, two 15,000 years ago, because the lake dried up. Now, this is, this is fascinating because first of all, before we go any further, this is the oldest ritual cremation found on the planet, but it happens to be in the southeastern part of Australia. One thing. So the lake dried up 15,000 years ago. Um, and at various early periods, uh, the, the lake and there's a lake system there were full of water. The landscape was originally surveyed in 1968 by um, a geomorphologist known as Jim Bowler, um, studying the climatic history of the, the landscape here. It known, the overall landscape is known as the Wuladra Lakes. This site is known as Lake Mungo that we're looking at within that landscape. And then he noticed, to be brought to the attention of the archeologist the following, uh, following year, um, he noticed burnt bones that were, um, that were coming out and be eroding out of the large crescent shaped dune on the eastern side of the now um, dried up Lake Mungo. A team of archeologists removed the remains in a block and took it back to excavate. And what they found out was, was amazing. These were the remains of not only the oldest known ritual cremation, um, but these were the remains of a young woman dating back 25,000 years ago. Her body had been burnt and then the ritual comes into it that her bones had been smashed up. So anyone knows anything about cremation in the modern day and age, those that, um, the ashes that come out of the um, furnace, it's then ground up and then it's put into a casket. So they were doing this 25,000 years ago. Um, these were then collected and buried in a small depression. So you've got cremation, ritual um, hole in the ground. So this was all 25,000 years ago. So that's quite amazing. In 1974, now this is, this is as amazing. An even older, more complete skeleton was discovered. Now this is great. Um, so again, back to what I said at the beginning, you've got lots of evidence in one area that's earlier than anywhere else. And still they came out of Africa. Um, so, they found an inhumation burial dating back to 30,000 years ago, not cremated, a body laid out. Now, this is an amazing piece of evidence. It's, it's 30,000 years old. We, we don't have many complete sets of hum any hominid remains of that date anywhere on the planet, right? You might get the odd Neanderthal here and there, but oh my God, that's a Neanderthal, what am I saying? So, um, so you know, this is a wonderful set of human remains. Now. I don't want to mention it, but I will. Um, I don't believe that the body in, was actually originally from Pavlan Cave, but radiocarbon dating on the Gower at Pavlan Cave tell us that the human remains that were eventually deposited there, probably by the, by the antiquarians um, in 1822, um, those bones turned out to be very disarticulated and not complete. And secondly, they dated to around 28,000 years ago. One of the most semi-intact sets of human remains in Britain. However, this set of remains is complete, buried, and from 2000 years earlier on another continent. Um, and it starts to make you wonder, weird. Also, this adult male was deliberately buried on his side and sprinkled with red ochre. And what was the Lady of Pavlan cave covered? With red ochre. But this is 2000 years 
but this is 2,000 years earlier and thousands of miles away, thousands and thousands of miles away. Other sites around the lake provide a vivid, vivid picture of the lives of the people who camped there uh, when the lakes were full of life and water. Now, from the evidence associated with their campfires, we know that they ate fish and frogs, frog bones. Um, freshwater mussels and the remains of crayfish would be found, and they have found them. Um, study of the fish bones has shown that most of they ate most of one species. Now, this is important, known as the golden perch. And most of the bones show that the golden perch was of similar size, meaning that they were probably catching them using nets. So if anyone, what they would have done, they, they would have thought they would have done the holes in the nets big enough for little perches to swim out, um, but not, not too big that they could catch the more mature golden perches, and that's what they ate. So not only not only do we know that they are eating fish, they're they're catching them with nets between thirty and forty thousand years ago. Lots of first year, aren't there? Um, the uniformity suggests um, the uniformity of the nets suggest obviously you know they've got that technology. Uh, the people also hunted animals such as the wallaby, the wombat, the native cats. Uh, rat kangaroos and lizards, and they cooked. They 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 cooked their food. Wow. No, actually, wow, amazing. Because we've got evidence of campfires and ground ovens, um, and you know one of them was dated to thirty thousand years ago. So we've got, you know, we've got real civilization out on this sort of lakeside on the plain with all those animals and so on. Um, these ground ovens were shallow pits and contained ash and charcoal on cooking stones or lumps of baked clay. Now, interesting enough, there's two interesting things. Me and Bill have come across something like this. It's known as burnt mounds on Orkney. What you would do, you would have a fire. You'd, put, um, you'd take a stone out and you put in a vat of water, heating the water maybe just below boiling point, right? They were doing that here as well. Um, now, they also know that they were doing that because Aboriginals use exactly the same techniques today. So hence why you've got to have Aboriginals to work on their archaeology because they know what they're doing, basically, because they're already doing it. Ethnologically, which is a word that I very rarely use, but ethnologically, sort of the, the study of culture and traditions, Eth which is what um, Anne's daughter studied, actually, Mary. Ethnologically, um, they compare modern technology with that technology and it's not changed. So we know precisely. We're not guessing there. Um, stone tools used mainly for chop chopping, cutting and scraping are commonly found in the area. Recently, with microscopic analysis, traces on the edges of some of them um, are to found traces of the oils and the fats associated with meats. So we know that they're scraping tools for meats um, and for cleaning plant tubers. So when you clean a plant tuber, um, you, you know, that the sort of fibers, the rich fibers are gonna be embedded in some of the stone faults and so on and sort of other residues. So you can find that. These are beyond startling finds. These are, these are amazing finds. So that this is what the lake looks like today, no water. Um, and the landscape today, and that's the point. A point I made today was that these people lived within this landscape. Um, and these are people that are better than us because they've lived within this landscape for tens of thousands of years. Um, whereas we've completely decimated our own landscape and then we come along to Australia with our, with our sheep and our um, cattle and we devastate the landscape within a few decades. These people are better than us because they know, they know how to live. So these were startling finds, the first definitive evidence that Aboriginals had lived in Australia during the last ice age. So in other words, there's a place known as Keneath Cave in Queensland and at Keneath Cave in Queensland, 
they've now they've been finding evidence of people living in underhangs in caves for up to 40,000 years ago and 60,000 years ago in terri territorial rock shelters. Um, so I don't want to talk about this little paragraph here because we've done it to death about people going over to Australia. But one thing I'd like to do is to have intercourse with Henry um, with something that he said earlier on. Um, and this is about the cow swamp people. Um, because me and Henry are singing off the same hymn sheet. But before we get to the cow swamp people, these are south of Lake Mungo in the area, or close to the area that um, the Mudgile site that we mentioned in Victoria. So this cow swamp people are from around there. This is the last thing we will do. But before we do that, you know, looking at the landscape today, lots of bones lying around. And there you go, Mungo man. You can imagine Flash Gordon coming across Mungo. King Mungo! Anyway, so Mungo Man. So this is rather interesting. And what you do see, this body's from 41,000 years ago. Um, we don't, we, we, it's very rare to have anything like this anywhere on the planet, but they've got over a hundred of these things across Lake Mungo. Yeah, again, a massive concentration of evidence, right? Okay, how did I, what was the analogy I used earlier on? Um, yeah, so if you look at the Roman Empire, the best remains of the Roman Empire are in Italy, and the worst sets of Roman remains are actually in Britain. Um, there are no Roman, basically no Roman remains in London. There are one or two, you know, the, the um, uh, Mithrium and, and bits of walls and stuff. Um, but there's basically no Roman remains left in London. If you compare that with Rome, there's loads of it. And then you, by, by that assimilation, um, you, can, you can work out that... Um, you know, civilization evolved from Italy for the Roman world. If you've got so much evidence in Australia for these people and nowhere else, you start to come up with another conclusion than, than what I've been reading out. We're not going to spell that conclusion out. If you can see the prim primitive evolution somewhere, you might be able to see what I'm saying. Our friends again. Um, and our friends creating these footprints in the mud at Lake Mungo 40,000 years ago. And I tell you what, right, when um, the, I've had two sets of racism this week because of this lecture, and, the, um, and I'm glad none of them were recorded, but the other bit of racism was that I had on Monday. I'm not saying which class on Monday. And one person said, they're really ugly, ugly brutes. And I said, you what? And I said, they're really ugly brutes. So I swapped, I swapped. And they, they, she was saying it were really ugly brutes, the slaves that they saw, right? So I said, all right, then look at this image. And this, this face is an absolutely beautiful face. The beautiful brown eyes, those teeth, the hair, the ears, beautiful face. And you can't say that that's not beautiful because it is. Um, and, you know, it, it's, that, it's that sense of these people keeping to who they are throughout these ages. And, and you, you're looking into those eyes and you, you feel the innocence um, and the innocence to the, uh, these Aborigines need to be given back to them. They need to be given back their history. They really do. So the site that we're gonna look at quickly is the um, Cow Swamp site. This is still at Lake Mungo, but the archeology have been working on is very similar. More of these footprints at um, Lake Mungo, okay, where there's a, at times a little bit of water in the um, rainy months, Lake Mungo. Um, so what I'll probably do now is, this, we'll, let's look at these footprints and let's use this as a, as a, as a zoom in, the last slide that we look at. I, I, no, actually, not, it's not true. At the end, I'll just guide through a few. Um, so let's just, this last point, up Cow Swamp, um, they excavated some remains and, you know, they said um, that the remains that they found um, were, were not like modern Aboriginal remains. But then they found in 1967 at Cow Swamp, again before that 1970 uh, and before Lake Mungo, um, they found the remains of 40 individuals. 
again, 40 individuals. These didn't date back tens of thousands of years. They dated back 13,000 years ago. But these were men, women, and children. And as described in my notes, these people had, had characteristic, robust, and rugged features, very similar to contemporary, um, modern-day Aborig Aboriginals. So these people, you know, their features are the same as they were 13,000 years ago. Amazing, that. Um, I'd like to know a bit, bit more about the height of that, those people, actually. As at Lake Mungo, um, the burial, there were grave goods, um, stone tools, animals' teeth, and muscle shells, um, and headbands of, of teeth, one person or more. So, you know, you look at this and you, th you, you think that there is so much evidence out there. And um, these notes, these notes are rather interesting. The, the, the writer of these little bit of notes here is a chap by the name of Alan Thorne, working in Victoria at Cow Swamp. He says that there had been at least two separate migrations to Australia from different parts of South East Asia. The robust cow swamp people were similar to more ancient fossils from Java, while the more gracial Mongol people were closely resembled to Chinese finds. Christ. Um, so in other words, there's nothing in here about Africa in this little bit of note here that's amazing. Thorne's ideas remain controversial. Other scholars stress the diversity of Aboriginal remains and feel that the differences have been exaggerated. However, um, and, and it's saying about, another expert says that the evidence a cow swamp is to do with head binding practices in inference, giving them more pronounced features. But then again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna leave it there. A um, good place to leave it, um, enough from me. Going back to the Rio Tinto site that is no longer with us. Um, and that's no longer there. Those archaeologists working, that's no longer there. Mm -hmm. And our friend, you'll be giving back your history one day. And just, um, and that man there, I want the name of that man next week. Because that is a very famous individual. And you can tell me next week what happened to his mortal remains after he died, and you will be horrified. And we will one day, in the next few months, look at Aboriginal art. Closing the book tonight and the chapter on this one, I would like to say that you can't do Aboriginal art without understanding these people. Now, at least we've got some understanding of them. We may be able to understand their art. Next week, Peking Man and a little bit about other early origins of species on the planet. Um, and what we're going to do, um, I've made all my announcements tonight. I will see those of you this evening, Jessica and, and, and Bill, my SWAT. SWAT, yeah. Um, I don't think Pat joins us tonight. Anyway, um, so what I'd like to do is ask if there's any questions. Pat, have you got any questions? Oh, no, I I've got to go, so I'll uh, say goodbye, okay? Take care, Pat. See you soon. Okay. Big Great. hug. Bye. Big hug, big hug. Right, so what about you, Billis? I'm just clarifying. Lake Mungo is a dried-up lake. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, there's, there's so much left out there to find, isn't there? Well, actually, if you know, when you think about it, if we've been look at working on our archaeology for 250 years, and they've only been working on the Aboriginal archaeology for 30 odd years, we're still finding yeah. stuff. Well, and mm -hmm. Australia's vast. And and uh, the, if you're going to look at Lake Mungo, you need to go to New South Wales and the Willandra Lake System. Willandra. I, I okay. do like Yeah. Willandra. Right, he's got a map of Australia because he's been there. Uh, right, um, Henri, anything from you? No, I've, I've found that really intriguing. Thank you very much. It's, it's quite a deep one as well. Um, yeah. What about you, Jessica? I just thought it was a really good lecture, yeah. Thank you. Um, and Del, Del, 
a yeah, guy I, a, a guy who snores in my lecture. If you want to catch up with this, you can get it on YouTube. Just call me Pat. We can't. Oh, you can call you Pat because she's gone. Well done. Go on, anything yeah. quick, Dan? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, with the um, sort of starting of archaeology with the Aboriginals in Australia, are there any issues with um, uh, tribal customs and culture? Oh, yeah. Say, say that bit again. I lost that bit. So run that past me. Are there any issues with tribal culture and sort of taboos and stuff like that with some of the places? Yes, there are. Um, obviously, um, the, the Red Rock that we... Uh, is it Ilderu? Um, I forgot the name of it. Uluru. Uh, Uluru, that's the one. Um, that is a very powerful site and it you know the, the traditions and if you if you if you want to know about um if you want to know about aboriginal traditions look at that one um and i think i think much of much of what we much of what we think about um the aboriginal world is it still is still live mm. um and writing some of it down is taboo um mm. I, I i found I don't know if you found Dell that when you um, when you write something down you forget it. Oh yeah, I fall asleep. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes if you keep it in your mind, it, it's in your mind. Yeah. So uh, so it, it it was like Jessica. She she thought right, I've got to come along to Carl's <laughs> lectures again one day. She kept her in her mind, and there she is. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, uh, before 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 everybody goes, and something quick. Oh. I can't remember. Remember, I, I was going to lend you a book by Bruce Chatwin. Dickinson. What? Was it Bruce Chatwin? And he wrote a, a story about the Oh, he did it on the Black Hill, didn't he? Mm. Yeah, I, I oh, think. Oh, no, it's not Bruce Chatwin. It must be somebody else. I think that's in the library. Anyway, anything else, Anne, before we go? Because I've got another oh, lecture tonight. No. Please. <laughs> All right, then. Right. OK, then. That's Thank everybody you. today. I really appreciated um, this video will be up there soon. Peking next week. Um, and that and that guy I showed that um, that black and white photograph of that guy. Tell me more about him next week. Uh, he's, he's quite a famous um, Aboriginal and you will be surprised with his story. But it's best to leave that to your own reading. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to say good night to Bill. Henri, Del, Annie, Penny, Danny, um, Jessica. I'll see Bill and Jessica tonight, and and Annie, Penny. Hi um, all. And Bye. 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 Um, he always does that. He, he's doing a Kathy with me. I'm getting it wrong every week. Right. So, um, right. Uh, so somebody else wants to chat about something, do they? Um, yeah, I was just wondering if, um, do you need, do you want me to send over lesson plans to you as well, Carl? But um, just to see whether you approve of everything. Right. Now, what, what, what is going to happen? What is, what is going to happen? Um, that, um, Bye bye. Bye bye, bye Henry. I'll let you carry on. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, I'm, I'm, I will. Okay, right there we go. Right, so right, so when with the online college now, um, obviously every yeah anything like that would be useful. Yeah. Um, because um, I think I think we're going to have to run it like a college to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect. That's fine. So um, so you will have you will have your own office as well. <laughs> love it so the thing the thing is the thing is the way the way we envisage this is more or less going to come to fruition in the next few months but the other part of it stage two um i um so say for example you're online in the college right and, and one of your students walks in and they can tap your door and have a chat with you in your room as an avatar yeah so, so that, that that's that's basically that's the basically the level yeah, we're going to go to. I, I yeah, it sounds really sophisticated. I like the sound of it, Carl. When you were telling us, it, it's it really good. It has it has to be the way. To, to be honest with you, if I sat down and thought about it, I'm absolutely petrified. But the fact of the matter is, um, I've got no choice. Yeah, I, I there there is no choice anymore. And um, you know, um, 
the, the beginning of the year, the beginning of the year, it was a completely, everything had a different direction. It was, it was yeah. completely different. I, I was supposed to be doing a, a, a live archaeology show with a big audience in Chepstow about now. And it's, it's, oh you know, no. You know, that, that was, that was what we were going to do. And, um, and I was going to slowly pull away from archaeology, come in the lectures and all the rest of it. But now yeah. it's, it's the, the lectures have gone into, gone into this world and it's, it's, yeah. been, it's been absorbed. Um, and I said, I said to my son with, with what we've got planned for the future, I've said, I need a room, which is empty, which is, which has got nothing but green walls. Um, because it'll yeah. be a completely virtual space. That that's where we're going. Yeah, yeah, so, no. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's the thing is I always I always said I, I'm still a great advocate of of publishing proper books, hard books yeah. and stuff, right? But um, that's very different than actually teaching. Yeah, it, it yeah it is. So you can have those hard books, you know, for example, when, when, when somebody enters the Cornwall experience, they can be sent um, a proper book on Cornwall. Yeah. But, but the rest of the experience is virtual. Yeah. That, I think that would be, you know, to have a book as well with it. Yeah. I feel like that would be good. So it's, it. say, 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 for example, we said, right, we got the, We've got the Cornwall excursion um, next weekend. We're going to have like 10 sessions over two days and it's going to be like a hundred pounds. And, and then we get, a, um, we got, we got a few, um, it, basically this is a, um, a Cornish tourism thing. So we have one shop in Penzance providing pots of jam, or we've got another one providing beer. So what mm. happens is out of that hundred pounds, somebody gets a pack of like 20 pounds worth of stuff sent from Cornwall. So that's yeah. giving somebody work in Cornwall and it arrives on their doorstep a few days before the presentation and they're yeah. sat there on their sofa with Cornwall. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, I think it's good. The, the little aspects of it, the little touches, is not just something that's online in it's having it come to you. I yeah, it has to, uh, there has to be a physicality. Um, mm. You know, there, there has to be, and, and to be honest with you, when, when you when you bring the physicality into it then then it's it's part of the tourist industry in cornwall cornwall yeah. still producing something for the tourist trade and this is why we want to do this yeah no definitely think is a great way to go but, but at this at this minute at this minute the um there are no staffing levels because um this is such high technology it's going to be um difficult to get people in to actually understand what we're doing yeah so uh yeah uh, it's new. It's new wave archaeology, and there's so few of us doing it. Yeah, it, it, it is very fancy. Yes, I think it, it is. It's impressive because you know I was just thinking of a basic website because I'm not very good with tech, and I think you've you know from what you've said, sounds really good, Carl. No, it's it's gotta be, and and thank you. And the other thing as well is you know your Instagram and Facebook feeds, all yeah. that all that is part of the. That that's all into it. All the YouTube stuff. Actually, the yeah. YouTube, the YouTube channel thing, right? All all that will be um, everything will be integral. Everything will be in there. Yeah. Everything's going to be branded. It's going to be different world. Yeah, I like it, and I I think being like that as well could sort of bring more people as well. Yeah. Um. No, no, no. This is this is the whole point. You can't do it. This 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 me this is money this is this is costing money but we've got money there we've got some of the money to do it but mm. obviously um, that money has to then um, bring in money so yeah. yeah the the rule the rule about business I think the rule about business is is that um, I remember somebody telling me something this um, I've never I've I've only started to under, understand this over the years um, if you I can't remember what it is. If you use 1% of your income on advertising, right, it's not going to do much good. If you use 50% of your entire income on advertising, the results are massive. Yeah, yeah. The, the more money you spend on advertising, so say, the better. yeah, say, say for example, uh, you've got a business that's uh, making £10,000 a year, right? 
but you use £5,000 on advertising, that could bring in £50,000 a year. Mm. If you keep if you keep investing just a hundred pounds, then it's only going to bring in yeah that same thing. It's it's like me. I, I've uh, I must have spent about sixty to I, no, I put about not sixty to seventy. I put about I can't remember how much it was between about twenty and thirty stickers around places in Cornwall, right? Um, and I and I I love sticking stickers up, right? But that's our own advertising. Yeah. If I you. You know, little things like that. You might get one person in through the door, but it's worth it. Yeah, no, definitely. I agree. So uh, anything, else, anything else you want to ask me before you dash? No, that's perfect. I'm just asking that, just double checking everything over. Brilliant. Brilliant. Perfect. Uh, I'll see you later, Carl. See you later. Take care. Take care. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Hmm. Uh, so, yes, virtual discussion and anyone listening to that, that's sort of the plan forward. Um, yeah, sometimes be really good and open with these things. And anyway, whoever's out there watching this managed to get to the end of the video. Thank you for watching. Um, and I think the whole thing is to just keep out there and keep going. Thank you very much.